uh, this is not so much lecture as uh, trying to figure out what we're doing in this class. Right? What's the point of this class? Um, for me, I'm, I'm, I said I'm much more of a biblical studies kind of person. That's because there's a, there's a rule book, right? There's like a defined foundation. This is it, right? And so if we come together and try to figure out an answer to something, like we've got the answer somewhere, and we have to filter through and find it. Um, theology, I think, is more ethereal, more, more um, intangible, then like, let's look at the facts and see what the text says and read it in Greek and figure it out, right? Theology is more um, figuring things out, right? It's more um, studying and learning and trying to understand things that you can't see or grasp, right? What, what do you all think when you see theology? What do you think the word means? The way that the Bible perceives. Okay. Like, like, what, what does God mean by the things he says? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody know Greek? Okay. So what is it in Greek? <laughs> you should have said I do. In Greek. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, can you see this marker? I don't actually? remember. Uh, I just know that uh, I know theos. Uh-huh. Is? Is God. Uh -huh. um, so I know. Man, you made a good marker. Um, how I would define theology is um, the study of God's action against his characteristics. Um, his. Uh, I don't know what other word to use. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. So, Theo. I gotta make my own marker next time. Uh, Theo is God, like you said. And. Logi, right? You've seen this before. Biology, right? Studio. Studio. Yeah, that's it. Um, I think it comes from logos, right? Mm -hmm. So words pertaining to the study of God, right? So strictly, in the strictest sense, theology is the study of God, understanding God. But um, in in the broad sense, it's I think technically like the study of God and anything related to God, which like from our perspective, is everything, right? What's something that's not related to God? I mean, everything, everything has to do with God somehow. So we, in theology, we cover um, we cover pretty much everything, right? Uh, theology one, we talk about the foundation, we talk about who God is and how God exists as a trinity and the creation and everything else. In this class, we, um, I mean, we talk about all sorts of stuff. There's, especially popular now, there's, you know, blank theology, and you can fill the blank in with anything. Political theology, music theology, right? A theology applied to whatever it is, because everything has to do with God, and so everything has to do with theology, right? That's the idea. Um, that's why it's difficult to define or understand what it is that we mean by the term, is because it's all-encompassing. Having to do with God and everything to do with God means it has to do with everything. Um, I know we talked about this in hermeneutics. Do you all listen to music? Do you all listen to music? I sound like I'm a thousand years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, music is, even non-Christian music, um, is very theological. Uh, I'm thinking of examples in my head of like secular music that you can listen to on the radio. You're like, man, they, this song, even though they don't have, know anything about it, is telling me something about God. Um, my, my example that I always go to is John Mayer has a song called Something's Missing, mm -hmm. if you're familiar. Um, it's an old song from back in the day. Uh, but he goes through and says, you know, I've got all these things. I've got money, I've got messages waiting for me on the phone, I've got uh, music to listen to, I've got all these things, check, check, check. But something's still missing. I'm still, I'm still, I've, I'm fulfilled in all the ways that people told me I should be, but something is still missing inside of me. That speaks to me, where I, I don't know that John Mayer knows what he's talking about theologically, but for me it's talking about sin, 
It's talking about the emptiness that we experience when we don't have a relationship with God, right? And, you know, John Mayer, who has no idea, probably, I don't think, about that, recognizes his, his issue, right? Where he's at as a fallen creature, he recognizes that, right? There's, uh, Megan's gonna lie. There's Taylor Swift songs. I, I really like Taylor Swift. Um, Taylor Swift has songs where she says things where I don't think she knows what she's saying, but they say theological things that speak to me because this is the this is what I'm steeped in, right? So she will say things uh, about relationships or about family or whatever it is. We're like, oh, that's a very theological claim that she's making. She doesn't know it, but it is. You could also look at it the other way of looking at like Christian music. Um, Obviously, Christian music has a theology. Does Christian music have a good theology? Right? Not always. Not always. Um, I get into this with my wife all the time because she, you know, we listen to whatever the radio station is in the car, um, safe for little ears or whatever, because our kids are in the back. Um, and we'll be listening to a song, and my wife's not really thinking about it. I'm like, is this true? And she'll be like, what are you talking about? I'm like, the words in the song, is what the person is saying true? Because I don't think it is. It might sound good. It might have rhymed with the previous line. But I don't think it's true about God theologically. You know what I'm talking about? I have an example in my head, but I don't know if I want to say it. Because um, I don't don't know if you guys are going to sing it in chapel in an hour. Um, Be brave. Just do it. Now we'll all sing a different lyric. (laughs) So um, there's a song that's on the radio now. I'm trying to think of the name of the artist. I think it's Tarn Wells. Oh, uh, I know exactly what uh, you're going Crazy with this. About You. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the name of the song. Uh, but he says, these in the, he says things in the song where I'm like, I don't know that this is true. Let me see if I can pull up lyrics. It's actually a controversial is it? song. Yeah. Good. He, he got a lot of heat for it. Um, let's see. Crazy About You. Is it Tar and Wells? Yeah, it's Tar and Wells. Is it Crazy About or Crazy For? Uh, yeah, let's see. So first of all, we're just going to go through this, okay? Because this is kind of how this class runs. I'm just going to write down <laughs> the objectionable lines in this in the song. Um, I mean, obviously the the song is called "Crazy About You," and the main lyric is uh, talking about God. Is he? Right? Like, I I understand the, um, I understand the metaphor, right, where we use that to say, like, oh, they're really in love. They're crazy about each other. Right? But what does the metaphor actually mean? It means that you've abandoned reason for the sake of your emotions. Mm -hmm. Is that how God operates? No. Right? It's not... Um, I don't think it's this song. I think it's a different song, but I also uh, don't Well, then you, then you do have to go to the thing of what do we mean by the word crazy. Right. You know, I mean, it all hinges on that. Right. There's another song that's on the radio, and I don't think it's this one, but it talks about, um, it's talking about the love of God, and it calls it reckless. The mm-hmm. only kind of reckless love of God. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. Um, I'm not a worship leader sort of person. Choreo, so. yeah. Okay. Is it, is it reckless? Right? I don't know what the opposite of reckless is. In my head, it's full of wreck. Right? The way that God loves us is not crazy. He doesn't abandon reason to love us. And it's not reckless. Right? He doesn't abandon his responsibilities in order to love us. Right? It's intentional. It's intentional. It's planned. It's part of who he is and why he does the things that he does. Right? And so I'm, I'm listening to these songs, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Um, I thought there was another line in this song. Um, yeah, it's crazy about you. He didn't want to live without you. Mm. Uh, he says uh, he's only been madly in love, which is the same thing as crazy. Um, yeah. Uh, didn't want to live without you. Where was it? He's never been mad at you. I'm like, hmm. 
Uh, <laughs> we could probably debate that, <laughs> right? Um, I think it's Romans one nineteen says that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth in their wickedness, right? I mean, it sounds a little mad, mm -hmm. right? Like if we're talking about the wrath of God, it's maybe not, um, I think we think of mad as like, again, the opposite of this, as like abandoning reason to experience this emotion of anger. And I don't think God is doing that, but I mean, it seems like he's not thrilled about us abandoning him and being enemies against him, right? Um, yeah, so I don't know. I listen to the song and I'm like, uh, I don't know that these words, I, I don't know that I agree with the theology that they're talking about. It has a theology, but I don't know that it's, it's what I would subscribe to, right? So all of that <laughs> tangent to say, theology encompasses everything. Right? It's all around us. And everybody that we meet has a theology, has a way of understanding God and the world around them. Atheists have a way of understanding God and the world around them. Um, they just call it humanism. Right? But that's a theology. That's a way of understanding the world. We call it a worldview. Right? It's the way of understanding the world with or without God and how we function in the world in relationship to God and in relationship to others. Right? Um, I think part of the purpose of this class, for me at least, is for us to be more aware of our own theology and the theologies that we're experiencing around us, right? If we're watching TV or a movie or if we are listening to music on the radio or having a conversation with our spouse or, or, you know, family, your parents or whatever it is, understanding the theologies at work around us. Good? Questions on that? Are we singing it, either of those songs in chapel in an hour? <laughs> Good, we're in the clear. Um, let's see. So, so in Theology 1, these are some of the topics that we cover. God, the Trinity, and creation. We will not kind of dive into these topics because they're going to be covered in Theology 1. Whenever you take that, that's the point of this guy. These are the topics that we're sort of covering in this class. Um, where, you know, we're going to start off with something cheery like sin. Um, <laughs> and, and just go from there. But the point is, um, while we're talking about sin, we're talking about these things. Right? When we're talking about salvation or the church or the end times, these things are going to come up. So there's going to be overlap. But we're not going to dive into the nuances of Trinitarian theology, right? because that's just not the point of this cause. So we're talking about sin and its ramifications. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about ecclesiology is the big fancy word for the church, and then eschatology is the fancy word for the end times. Right? These are the main topics that we're going to be covering. Um, I think I've got another slide for more details on that. Um, Uh, I think this is in your syllabus, or at least this is a summarized version of it. Some of the topics that we're covering and kind of what they mean or what we're going to be uh, discussing in these. You'll notice that for a lot of them, we have individual and communal. What do you think that means? You yourself, and obviously you as the community. Right. So for sin, we talk a lot in like, Kind of, when I say we, I'm going to say this a lot, but it kind of means like evangelical Christians writ large. Us in this class, <laughs> us in SU, you know, whatever it is. We tend to talk about sin. We talk about original sin. We tend to talk about it at an individual level. We talk about our individual sin and God rescuing us from our individual sin, our own shortcomings and falling short, whatever else. And that's kind of the main focus. For Many Christians throughout history and today, um, there's a huge emphasis on the communal aspect of sin, where it's not just that when Adam and Eve sinned, it infected individual people, it affected communities, 
It affected the way that our society operates. It affected everything, right? And so while we tend to focus on the individual aspect, um, theologians will argue that there's a communal aspect of sin and there's a communal aspect of salvation. Um, so they'll point to things like um, social justice, which is kind of like a trigger word for people. But they people will view social justice as a communal operation of salvation to combat the communal aspects of sin in society. Right? The, there are... There are instances of sin in our community that go beyond the individual ways that people sin, that there are systems in place of sin that are oppressing people, widows and orphans and whatever else, um, and that part of our redemption is addressing those issues. Part of the restoration of the world is us as Christians um, operating to fix the communal issues of sin. Right? We call it social justice. Or we call it, um, I think social justice is here, works of grace. Right? Where we go and feed the homeless, not because we are good people or we want to operate in this way or because we as individuals have been redeemed. We do it because, as a community, we recognize that homelessness is an aspect of communal sin. Right? That there are systems in place that are sinful. And therefore, we as redeemed people have to address them. Good? Good. Um, this will pop up repeatedly, I think, throughout the class. We will talk about sanctification. We'll talk about the Holy Spirit. We'll spend time talking about spirit baptism, Pentecostalism, the views on that. It's an AG school, right? So we're going to talk about these sorts of things. It's kind of an emphasis. Um, and then we will... We will I mean, we'll end with the end times. Talk about eschatology. We're going to talk about different views of the end times and where where we're at with all of that. Any questions on kind of the topics that we're covering? Good. I assume they went to get ready for worship. Okay. So there are different types of theology. Um, I'm going to write them up here so that we can talk about them. And, you know, blanket statement for the whole class. Sorry for my terrible handwriting. Uh, but it's not going to get any better over the next eight weeks. So, you know. I think I was supposed to be left handed, and my parents forced me to be right handed. So. <laughs> Terrible. Um, what does this mean to anybody? What is systematic theology? What does the word systematic mean? Apart from theology, what does this word make you think? A certain form? Okay. Mm -hmm. Government. Say it again? Government. Government. What do you mean by that? I guess like you know how one nation under God kind of type thing. Okay. I see what you're saying. Like marriage laws and okay. uh, credit bills every seven years type, you know, maybe it's theolo I think about theology and systematic, I think about stuff like that, you know, how things are set. Okay. Um, with God in mind, I guess, you know, in the system of, like, how it is. Systems of human operation. Okay. Yes. So I think what you're describing, I understand what you're saying. I think that actually probably goes under practical. Okay. When you're talking about, like, governance. Um, what we mean by systematic is um, systematic not in the way that it's applied, which I think is what you're talking about, but systematic in the approach to theology. Where, um, like how the Bible teaches us, like, no, because the way the Bible teaches us is going to be right there. There's a lot of overlap between how all of these work out. 
Um, this just means that the way that you teach theology, the way that you learn theology, the way that you go through it, is systematic. There's a form and a system in the way that it's... So on you know day one, you talk about God. And this, as a system, you go through the whole Bible and you develop a theology on God as a topic. Let's say that, topical. Right? And then day two, you talk about what? Jesus. And then I guess day three, you have to talk about the Holy Spirit. And then, you know, you'll spend time talking about the Trinity. How does that work? Right? And these are issues that you go through systematically until you've exhausted the, the corpus. Right? You go through coming up with everything, and you apply um, the Bible and reason and whatever else to come up with systems for all of these different things. Right? We come up with words like Trinity, which is nowhere in the Bible. Right, to understand things that are in the Bible. Um, there's a lot of words that we have, theological words for stuff, that are not in the Bible. Um, Trinity being the, the core example. I think that the Trinity is biblical. Right, It's an idea that I think is right, theologically. But it's not a biblical idea. It, it doesn't come from the Bible. We read the Bible and then we think, oh, this has to be the way that it's talking. This has to be the understanding behind it. But that idea is systematic, right? And the way that you're approaching your theology, right? So this textbook is an exploration of Christian theology. I thought it said systematic on here. Um, well, maybe the other one does. But it goes through chapter by chapter. Here's a chapter on God. Here's a chapter on scripture. Here's a chapter on the image of God, human, sin, whatever it is. And it goes through topic by topic, right? Now... The, I don't want to say the opposite, a different approach is what we call biblical theology, um, which tries to understand the Bible in its own terms. Um, so while biblical theologians would probably say, like, yeah, the Trinity is the correct way of understanding God, they would approach it slightly differently to avoid using the terminology that the Bible doesn't give us, right? So I think the, the classic example from my background is like um, a biblical theology of the kingdom of God, right, of kingdom. So they would go through and look through the Bible and try to understand what does God mean when he's talking about his kingdom? In the Old Testament, kingdom of Israel. In the New Testament, the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Right? What does the Bible tell us about these ideas? And they will go through and do that. So you still might have topics like God, right? Because the Bible tells us about God. But you've got more, um, more things in here that are strictly biblical, where the Bible is telling us words and we're using the Bible to interpret those words. Good? Okay. What about historical? The time, the place, um, things that were happening. Um, events. Keep talking. Um, when? What are you? What are you talking about? What time period are you talking? About? Like previous time period. So, the, what is it called? Like time period, like during the Roman Empire, stuff like that. Okay. <clears throat> um, you're partially right. I think what you're describing is kind of like biblical background. So um, when Jesus is, is operating, when Paul is operating, they're operating in this context of Rome. They're operating in this context of empire. Um, and so you're talking about like understanding the Greco-Roman culture to understand where the Bible fits in. Is that right? Yeah. Um, honestly, I think that would probably fit over here um, a bit. What we're talking about here is history, as you point out, but not exactly the history of what's going on in biblical times, but the history of what's going on since then. Specifically, theologians of the past who have come along and tried to do these sorts of things and come up with historical theologies. So this would look at, um, uh, I'm trying to think of examples, guys like Augustine, right? Probably the most famous theologian in Christian history, right? Most of our understanding of most stuff comes from Augustine. Um, but understanding Augustine's theology of 
X, Y, and Z, right? So Augustine's theology on the Holy Spirit. That would be a historical theology, right? So you could, and you could do this with literally everybody. From, from Augustine to, um, I mean, give me some names, Aquinas to MLK, right? Where they are operating theologically, they're writing theologically, but what they're doing is, um, or I guess what they're doing is probably systematic or biblical, but what we do when we're studying this is not systematic. It's not biblical. It's historical, right? The goal in reading Augustine's work on the Holy Spirit as the example is not to understand what the Bible says or what like a systematic theology would say about the Holy Spirit. It's to understand specifically what Augustine says about the Holy Spirit, and we can agree or disagree with that. So right? like experiences from other people. Right. Which might or might not be true. Right? Um, a good example would be Luther, right? who you know, famously started most of this, right? Uh, the beginning of the Reformation is because of Luther. So Luther's theology on a bunch of stuff we still look to, but we disagree with Luther's theology on a bunch of stuff, right? Luther said some very terrible things about the Jews, for instance, right? Um, so he nails his 95 Theses, he does all this stuff, which is great, but then, like, the Jews don't respond. He thinks that the Jewish people will accept the gospel now that he has properly taught it, and they don't. And so then he writes a whole treatise called On the Jews and Their Lies, right? And so, like, as a historical theology, we can understand what he's saying and fundamentally disagree with it, right? Whereas if you're doing a biblical theology, it would be a problem if you fundamentally understood what, like, the Apostle John is saying and then disagreed with it, right? You see the difference? Um, and then finally, practical theology. You brought up governance. Um, so, uh, in God we trust was your example. Like right, one nation under God. Yeah. Um, practical theology encompasses most of that. So you're talking about it kind of on a corporate level, on a um, communal level, like we were talking about before. But it can also be like. Um, It can also be like, we, we come up with an idea of Trinity over here, but how does our understanding of Trinity actually change our lives, the way that we operate day to day? That would be a practical theology, is um, the example that I like to use, which I think we probably talked about last semester, is does our understanding of the Trinity change the way that we pray? Because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, right? Christ, the second person of the Trinity, intercedes for us before the throne of God, the Father, the first person of the Trinity, right? And so when we pray, are we operating in a Trinitarian understanding of us participating in a Trinitarian relationship with God, right? Because the Holy Spirit is in us praying on our behalf, right? And so does our understanding, our systematic or our biblical understanding of Trinity, does it actually change something real about us? Do we apply it and make a difference in our lives? Or do we use that to make a difference in other people's lives? Or are there systems in place that are the, the outgrowing of some sort of theological belief, right? Um, trying to think of other examples of that, where there's a the uh, prohibition, right, in the 20th century. Americans got together and said, um, we think that alcohol is sin as like a a biblical theological issue, and because we think it's the sinful issue, we're going to practically live that out by abolishing alcohol. You see where I'm going? Yes. So what they're doing here in Prohibition is a practical theology, because there's some sort of claim about God going on back here, and right? God doesn't like people to be drunk, God doesn't like people drinking, whatever it is, and they're living it out in a communal way, right? And then eventually the theology changed where more people started saying, well, God doesn't care, and then prohibition changed because the theology changed. The way that people view the world changed. Mm -hmm. Good? Mm -hmm. All right. I don't know why the TV turned off or didn't turn back on. It looks like it's still on, though. Yeah. Hmm. Any questions about this with these four different things? Um, 
particularly in these are different ways of approaching theology, ways of understanding theology. I think for this class, we're going to be kind of in the systematic vein because that's the nature of a class like this. Um, whereas other classes, you might like take an upper level class on John where you're looking specifically at John's view of salvation, whatever it is. That would be a biblical theology of salvation because you're looking specifically at how does John understand this in his own words? And what words does he use? He uses eternal life, right? So he doesn't really talk about salvation. He talks about eternal life, but that's what he means, right? So on a systematic lens, he's talking about salvation. But for him, biblically, he's talking about eternal life. Good? Um, let's see if I can get the slides back up. I don't know where they went. There we go. So let's talk about this for a minute. How do we develop our theology? Where does it come from? I think at the very beginning, you said understanding the Bible, right? A perception of it. A perception of the Bible. So we talk about theology being everywhere, right? John Mayer's music having some sort of theological bent. It's not based on scripture, right? The way that he's talking about, the way that Taylor Swift is talking about stuff, it's not based on scripture. It's based on other stuff. When we talk about Christian theology, which is what we're doing, it's based on scripture. Right? That's kind of what our goal is. Is it based only on scripture? No. Why not? Because of how you were raised. Okay. Environment. Okay. Um, experiences. Okay. So, uh, like the Trinity. The Trinity is not in Scripture. Right? It's something that's been reasoned out. It's like a logical conclusion that people who came up with it think is supported by Scripture, but it's not technically in Scripture. Right? The term's not there. And so they use reason, they use logic, they develop the idea, and then they checked it on scripture. Right? Um, we talk about Augustine. A lot of our beliefs come from tradition, come from history. They either come from Augustine or they come from Luther. Right? I mean, as Protestants in America, that's where a lot of our beliefs come from. So if you belong to like a denomination, you can trace that denomination's roots from religious leader to religious founder to religious founder to religious leader or whatever, right? Um, most of our kind of Protestant, evangelical, American denominations are going to trace back to Luther. They're going to trace back to Augustine. Eventually they go back to the Bible, right, historically. But there's an aspect of tradition that goes there. Now what about for Luther, he comes along and says, well, there's all this tradition that the Catholic Church is doing but I don't think that it's biblical, right? They're teaching these things as tradition, but I don't think that there's a biblical backing to them, right? What do you do then? What does Luther do? Sure. Yeah. And what were what was the point of the ninety five thesis? I, this isn't a Reformation history class, but um, to um, expose the Reformation, right? And to say. This is what you're doing, this is your theology, and this is what the Bible says, and this is the discrepancy, right? 95 times. Um, so for him, he had this tradition that was, that was existing, that was operating, but he began to question whether or not it was accurate in terms of scripture, right? um, For centuries, these three things were the main ways that people operated in understanding their theology and developing their theology. I think Wesley is the one who comes along and adds experience. It could have been before him, but I'm pretty sure there's like the four pillars of Wesleyism, Wesleyanism. Um, he adds experience as a, a tool that's used to understand theology, to develop theology, right? I think most of us would understand how that operates where you experience something, whether it's your background or your upbringing like you brought up, or um, you're praying and you experience something. You think that God speaks to you, right? That's an experience, but then what do we do with that? 
of exegesis and the four pillars of hermeneutics or something. But it's our sources of theology, how we develop our theology, the way that we go about it. Um, but I think we're, we all kind of mentioned already. What takes precedent? Why? Because it's true. Okay. How do we know that it's true? What's that? Because God says it is and because it's been proven over and over again. Okay. God says it is. Huh. Where does God say it is? I guess it's like the resounding like circle of it says it is in the Bible. Right. So the Bible says that the Bible is true, so we trust the Bible. <laughs> but it's been proven like through science, like scientifically. Has it? I feel like that's where experience maybe comes in. Okay. On top of like what she's saying, like to some degree, scientifically it's been um, exposed as truth. Okay. But you don't really know it's in your experience, your one on one, like when you're saying you're praying and you feel like you hear God. I feel like, or like you have like a, an experience, just um, you go to a conference or you experience God, or you almost die, mm -hmm. and you're like sitting there and God's like, it's like a revelation of like. I think I believe this true, or I know I believe this true. It's like multitudes of experiences that are like a journey. Yeah. Um, we know that it's true. I think all of this work together kind of like what you're saying, but we know that it's true, one, because of our faith. So yeah. that relates to experience. But we also know that it's true because of tradition, because of the people who came before us, because of manuscripts and the testimony, eyewitness testimony mm -hmm. of others. So we have evidence and support to the fact that it's true, but part of it is based on faith and God that he is who he says he is. And that the Bible is for God. That's good. There's well, also the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. A lot of them. I don't know if I'm just mm -hmm. oh, Okay, there's also the archaeological evidence that points towards truth in the Bible. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's as simple as like, and Ray teaches in the theology that basically you know, the, the Bible is a story that kind of points to the center of we, over that many years you can't have that many people telling the same story <coughs> in the same way that basically it proves, I guess that's what I mean by scientifically, you see that this many people tell the same story and it adds up mm -hmm. they couldn't possibly have known the same story and then they couldn't have written it unless it was inspired by God so there's no way that it could be not true yeah. and that that many people could have transcribed it and it would be still the same story it's not possible the skeptic in me is like arguing in my head uh, against the stuff that, that we're saying. Because there's there's an argument to be made about like, I think Vody Bakum has this whole bit where he talks about um, somebody's like a gangbanger, this like rough guy, he gets in prison, and in jail he has this like revelation, this experience from God, where the Messiah comes to him and says, you gotta stop doing this, you gotta change your life. And he does, he's radically saved radically changed and he goes and starts preaching about like the person who came and, and talked to him the way that it changed his life and the way that it's going to change things moving forward um, but then at the end of the story Bodhavakum says the person was Malcolm X and the vision that he had was Muhammad and so the prophet came to him in jail so he was a gangbanger he was a rough guy um, the prophet came to him and he converted to Islam and through that conversion, he started, or he, you know, joined, I don't know the civil rights history, but the way that he moved, the way that he operated moving forward was because of his faith, right? But we would say that that experience was, what? Uh, I don't know the polite word to use, wrong. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, and so it's always, it's always tough for me to say that our experiences, you know, trump everything else. Yeah. 
So right? how would you answer that question? Which one? The one that you asked. I've been asking questions. Yeah. Say it again. How do you know that I'm going to Yeah, I, I think I bank on kind of what Megan was saying, where I look at, um, I mean, okay, I'm going to give the Sunday school answer, right? It, it, so for me, it comes to Jesus. It comes to, um, was Jesus telling the truth? in the things that he said and did, right? If he's telling the truth in the things that he said and did, then the Bible's true, right? Um, and how do we know if Jesus was telling the truth in the things that he said and did? For me, it's the resurrection, right? So Jesus made, like, absurd claims about himself and about the world, right? Like, hey, my dad is God, mm-hmm. and I'm also God. And like, I used to live in heaven, but now I'm here with you guys. <laughs> like, these are just bonkers things to say. And for centuries before Jesus, and for decades after, people made the same sorts of claims, right? There are other messianic pretenders. Um, pretenders doesn't mean like the faking, it means like people claiming to be the Messiah. Um, for centuries before Jesus. But what happens to them when they're killed? They're dead. They're dead, right? And their movement dies with them most of the time. Um, maybe sometimes a follower will rise up and kind of like try to take over the movement, but then most of the time, like, uh, Rome ends up killing the follower too. Um, what happened with Jesus? He came back, right? Um, not only, like, he came back, he also said he was going to come back, <laughs> right? And so if he's making these claims and then backing them up with, the proof of the resurrection. For me, that's what um, that's what establishes the things that he's saying are true. Does that make sense? Yes. Even in for, I think of First Corinthians fifteen. Yeah. That's now if Christ has been is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some say some you say that there's no resurrection, but if there's no resurrection, not even Christ has been raised. Mm-hmm. And if he's not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain, and you're misrepresenting God. And right. Da, 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 and he goes on. In verse 20, he says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Right. And all of those things. And I think in that passage, he goes on to say, like, Jesus appeared to these guys, he appeared to these guys, he appeared to, like, 500 folks all at the yeah. same time, and then he appeared to me, he appeared to Paul. Mm-hmm. Um, and that validates a lot of a lot of this for me. Yeah. Right? Where I can have difficulties with, with certain passages or, or, you know, discrepancies or whatever, like, people get so hung up on, uh, oh, the, when Jesus was being tortured, um, some, one gospel says that it was a red cloth that they wrapped him in, and one gospel says it was a purple cloth that they wrapped him in, and therefore, Jesus didn't really exist. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that, because, like, the color maroon exists, right? <laughs> Taylor Swift told me about it. Um, and so like some people might view it as red and some people might view it as purple and also it doesn't really matter oh it could have started out purple and then blood could have turned it red right Um, and so there's all of these different ways where if you start with the fundamental presupposition that Jesus is raised from the dead then you can work through whether or not it's purple or red or somewhere in between Mm. right Um, and so that's kind of that's kind of where I end up uh, is the Old Testament is harder um, for that, but also the Old Testament existed when Jesus was around, right? Jesus is preaching from the Old Testament. New Testament authors quote every book in the Old Testament except for, like, Esther, I think. I think there's only, like, one or two books in the Old Testament that they don't quote extensively. Um, and so for, for me, again, that gives validity to the Old Testament, where if Jesus had some problem with, like, oh, the Song of Psalms shouldn't be in the Old Testament, then Jesus would have said something, right? Because it was there the whole time, right? Not only did he have, like, the Hebrew scriptures, they had the Septuagint by this point. They had a Greek translation that they're using frequently. Um, and so, hit the resurrection, Jesus' claims about himself also gives credence to the stuff that's not really talking about him, per se, the Old Testament, right? I'm like, yeah, the Old Testament's point of Jesus. You know what I mean? Um, I know it's a Sunday school answer, but is this, is this good? Are we on board? Go ahead. One really cool thing that I heard, like I, I saw a video, and it was a person who does um, interrogation, 
And he said, one way you can always yeah. tell a story is fake is if everyone's telling the exact same story. Mm -hmm. And that's why he finds validity in um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they're telling the same story, but there's different aspects to it. It's mm -hmm. not just the same story. Yeah. And some people will look at that and be like, well, look, it's wrong because they're not telling the same story. And he looks at that and he goes, no. If I was doing an interrogation on a crime, and they were all telling me the exact same details, like the color was red, and everyone said it was red, or this exactly happened, and everyone's saying those exact words, that's how you know it's fake, because no, everyone's not going to have the same view of what happened. Right. Yeah, and the historical reality is that we always talk about like eyewitness testimony is, is the cream of the crop in terms of like a court of law. If you have an eyewitness, then you're... But eyewitnesses are also not very reliable even now, mm -hmm. right? And we kind of expect eyewitnesses to be like a video evidence of the crime. But there's a vast difference in, if I committed a crime and there's a video of me doing it, that is fundamentally different than if somebody saw me do it. Right? Because the testimony could be discredited, but the video is like, for sure. Um, I guess maybe not now with AI and whatever. Um, but, Jesus is making these claims, and Paul comes along and says, okay, but there's a 500 people that saw this. Right? There are eyewitnesses to it. And what is the likelihood that all of these people are lying? Right? That they're suffering this mass delusion, or whatever it is. What's the, what's the likelihood that 11 of the 12 apostles would suffer and be martyred for something that they knew was a lie? That Jesus did really raise from the dead. Right? Because if they all knew that it was a cover-up, that they really snuck in and stole the body, which was the rumor at the time, then eventually they would have given it up. Well, one of them would have. Yeah, 40 years later, are you still going to die for something that you lied about so long ago, right? Um, good? So, all that to say, we put Scripture as the the forefront, as the pinnacle of what we're talking about. So when we're doing our theology, we're going to be looking at Scripture a lot. Because this is where it's supposed to come from. Um, when we had the different approaches to theology on here, I think one of them in the, the textbook, they wrote philosophical theology, which I don't understand what that's supposed to mean. It sounds like it's just philosophy. Um, but this is the reason I don't like philosophy. is because philosophy has no rules. You think whatever you want to think, and you come up with a... It's all based on experience and reason, right? We have a set of... I don't want to call it a set of rules, but we have a, a foundation. We have a, a, a guide box. We have a, a limited um, prescribed range of things to talk about, a range of things to, to um, get information from, where you can't just come along and just make up whatever you want. Which have, in my opinion, that's what philosophers do a lot of the time. So they just make up stuff. It's just whatever. Um, but we're going to be turning to scripture a lot for the content of what we're talking about because that's where it comes from. Now, we can talk about tradition and say, oh, I don't really know what this text means. I wonder if there's somebody from tradition who can help me understand it. I wonder what Augustine thought of this passage. Or I wonder what Calvin thought of this passage. Or I wonder what uh, John Wesley thinks of this passage. Right? And we can come along and get help from those people, but we can come along and say, I don't think Wesley's right on this. I don't think Calvin's right on this. Right? So we read it, we understand more, we learn more. I understand what they're interpreting the text to say. I don't think that's what the text is saying. Right? We use our reason, which one of the ways that we can apply this is to say, okay, there's this text that I don't understand. I wonder if there's other texts that can help me understand it. And you use your reason to connect. Well, they're talking about this thing here, Logically, I think there's another text that would benefit me to help me understand this, right? And connecting different texts together, which is still based on scripture, but you're applying your reason to it, right? And then experience, we can also use, we can also benefit from, where we say, you know, I don't understand what this passage is saying, but I know I've experienced these things, and I think that my experiences are helping me understand what the passage is saying, right? That I understood, like, the, the mentality, the headset, the, the academic thought in the verse. But now this experience is helping me understand the meaning, the heart, what Jesus is actually supposed to be talking about. Does that make sense? Good. Any other thoughts on this? Yes. 